the shifting of the seasons in 18th century colonial Williamsburg was a time of transformation, both in the physical world and within the hearts and minds of its colonial townspeople. If you lived in the city in those days, as the colder months drew closer, a heightened awareness regarding sickness and well-being and the provision of medicines that could remedy ailments would have been of great concern for many. Just as a time capsule sealed away from long ago stores an era's essence for later discovery, my ambition on this day was to uncork some of the stories behind a bustling 18th century trade, once veiled in fierce competition and overwhelming saturation. Going behind the door of one of Williamsburg's restored specialty shops that once stood along the Duke of Gloucester Street, amongst the shadows of the nearby Capitol building, found me quickly immersed within the sights, and sounds, and scents of an old world apothecary. Welcome to those people who just come. This is the apothecary, shop with Dr. Pasteur and Dr. Walt. And they were doctors, surgeons, and pharmacists in the 18th century. Amidst rows of artistically decorated Delft medicine jars and fluid-filled glass bottles holding secrets of healing from centuries past, it was quickly becoming an enlightening experience as I curiously gazed in my surroundings. Primarily, the apothecaries are sources of imported goods. Um, now, they're not making these things up off the top of their heads. There are books called dispensatories, published by the medical communities in London and Edinburgh, and that's where these formulas are coming from. The interpreters inside the shop shared some interesting details regarding the significant role apothecaries played in 18th century Williamsburg while revealing some popular medical treatments and surgical procedures that were administered here. So they're diagnosing and treating illness, they'll do surgery, whether it's setting a broken limb or sewing up a laceration, or pulling that tooth. This is my tooth key. Oh, they have tooth. But as I continued to look about, I began wondering more of the trade itself and what it looked like more than two centuries ago. Some interesting stories of old revealed the practice of physic was highly competitive in Williamsburg during the 18th century. A young physician in the making seems to paint the picture of this reality clearly. After a tedious voyage sailing from Scotland to Virginia, lasting six months and 17 days, captained by a drunkard, Adam Cunningham's intention of practicing medicine in Virginia came to a halt when he realized an overabundance of practitioners in Williamsburg. Upon finally arriving, he wrote to his father with his unfortunate realization after some time spent in the capital town. Williamsburg is but a small village containing no more than 60 families at most. And in and about this city are no less than 25 or 30 physicians and of that number not above two capable of living handsomely. He would eventually succumb to his failed endeavor, leave Virginia and return home. Although the field of physic during the 18th century was filled by some who diligently attended medical schools and received the required degrees to practice, it was also congested with an assortment of people from other trades and businessmen claiming to be physicians, but with little or no training at all. These inexperienced individuals were often referred to as quacks, generally a term of abuse used to describe fraudulent, untrained practitioners and the medicines they would concoct, embellish, and often advertise to the public. Another common issue plaguing the medical field then were trained surgeons, apothecaries, and those practicing who only served apprenticeships to the trade, often inflating their rates and prescriptions. This led Virginia to put forth an act in 1736, which regulated the fees and accounts of those who practice medicine based on the type of education and training they received. 
those who attended universities and earned medical degrees could charge double than those who only undertook apprenticeships. The two doctors that eventually partnered to run the apothecary shop I was finally glad to be exploring were doctors William Pasteur and Dr. John Minson Galt. But first, my look back into how the field of medicine, surgery, and pharmacy blossomed within the city, based on some research I had done, most certainly would have to include one of Williamsburg's first real apothecary surgeons. Intently reading the pages of a popular colonial Williamsburg publication, I was transported back in time to learn more about his life. Dr. George Gilmer Sr. studied and trained in Edinburgh and London before moving to the colony of Virginia to practice medicine, where he also managed the affairs of a land company whose colonial headquarters were in Williamsburg. Definitely far from a quack, and one physician in town who could easily bask in the prestige of his occupation, while also leveraging the notoriety that came from his thoughtful selection of companionship. A widower three times throughout his life, each of his wives belonged to prominent, well-respected, and wealthy families. In the city, he would purchase a few plots of property nearby the governor's palace on and around the lands where the colony's first theater was located. The historic Frenchman's map, circa 1782, was void of showing Gilmer's business location. However, it does display an area which might have been where his apothecary was once located. Standing near the corner of the Palace Green and Nicholson Street in Williamsburg, on the site of the George Tucker House, which since 1788 still proudly stands today. Although his colorful personal life and professional career seemed to always be on the rise, even later becoming the mayor of Williamsburg. But like most, Gilmer's time as a practicing apothecary surgeon came with pockets of turbulence over the years. When the controversial 18th century physician, John Tennant, believed that patients of pleurisy, one of the most epidemic diseases in colonial Virginia, could benefit from the usage of a Native American remedy, Tennant once arranged to give away genuine Seneca rattlesnake root for free at Gilmer's apothecary, as he advertised in a column of the November 5th 1736 Virginia Gazette. Whereas I understand that several persons have provided rattlesnake root, which is not of the genuine kind, to follow my directions in the cure of pleurisy. Any person after the 25th may have the genuine rattlesnake root, gratis, at Mr. George Gilmer's apothecary in Williamsburg. It's assumed that Dr. George Gilmer, in conjunction with Tennant's research and persuasion, agreed to give free samples of snake root to patients looking to experiment with its healing properties, despite the ongoing criticism Tennant was receiving from the medical community. Although there were many people in colonial Virginia at this point who stood behind Tennant and the powers of his miracle plan, often accusing physicians who opposed the remedy as a selfish deterrent to uphold their incomes. One grueling rebuttal to Tennant's research, made public months before he advertised the real Seneca Rattlesnake Root's availability at Gilmer's Apothecary, attacked his credibility and the healing effects of his organic treatment. Harsh remarks and arguments that encompassed a full-page insert that ran on the June 10th, 1737 Virginia Gazette, written by a Virginia physician codenamed I.C that it is capable of making a seemingly dying woman, in four hours after first taking of it, rise from bed and be able to whip her children, carries the same probability as if it was said, this route will raise the dead to life. Let me advise you to beware how you engage in so extraordinary a voyage, where are innumerable rocks and the shipwreck death. 
I seriously advise you not to hurry yourselves inadvertently on so dangerous a coast. And though there's no record of any connection to Tennant's holistic remedy, being part of the treatment plan administered to one of Gilmer's sick patients, could it have been seen as suspicious to wandering minds then that on the very same page of the Virginia Gazette where Tennant's snake root advertisement ran, an obituary listing was placed announcing the death of a woman who was under the care of Gilmer at his home and the death of her husband just days after. On Monday morning last, died at Mr. George Gilmer's in this city, Mrs. Susanna Scaife, and on Thursday morning also died the Reverend John Scaife, her husband, after a tedious indisposition. Did these unfortunate deaths eventually lead others to publish an article announcing the supposed death as well as the indebtedness of George Gilmer himself. A claim he cleverly countered while reminding the public of his freshly imported inventory available at his apothecary shop found along the Palace Green. There being a report industriously spread about the country of George Gilmer's death by some well-meaning people and of his being so much in debt that nothing from England would be sent him this year if alive. To obviate such scandalous and groundless reports, I take this opportunity to acquaint all my friends that I can now, better than ever, supply them with all manner of chemical and galenical medicines. Mr. Gilmer's career allowed him to lavish on some of the luxuries of 18th century life in Williamsburg. He often rubbed elbows with some of the city's most powerful figures, and even once acquired the town's most prestigious social spot the Raleigh Tavern. And looking back at the evolution of apothecaries in Colonial Williamsburg, Dr. George Gilmer is a fascinating figure, partly responsible for igniting the medical careers of a handful of Williamsburg physicians through apprenticeships taken under his guidance. One such person who owned the apothecary I found myself submerged in on this day was William Pasteur, Returning to Williamsburg, Pasteur eventually went into business and opened his very own shop where he practiced as an apothecary surgeon. He would later undertake his own apprentice, a young teenager named John Minson Galt at the ripe age of 14, who after apprenticing would then too go on to study in London, attend the College of William and Mary, and even further his education in Edinburgh and Paris. I recalled an earlier visit to Colonial Williamsburg around the holidays where I crossed paths with Dr. Galt, talking to visitors along the Duke of Gloucester. Uh, I had no hand in this, but I think surgery is a far more um, prestigious profession than it used to be. Uh, in the days of the barber surgeon, yes, it's a very common place to look down on those people. But I think the understanding or the assumption of understanding of anatomy is something that is a bit more respected now, at least in Williamsburg, I can say. I can't speak to London, I can't speak to other places. It's certainly more respected now than it used to be. Later in April of 1775, an advertisement placed in the Virginia Gazette announced the partnership of Pasteur and Galt in Williamsburg. The subscribers having this day entered into partnership beg leave to acquaint the public in general and their friends and neighbors in particular that they intend practicing physic and surgery to their fullest extent. While wandering through the reconstructed apothecary, I slowly began to realize this place was not merely a dispenser of remedies, but a maestro of wellness for the people of the colony creating harmonies that resonated throughout time itself. Here's one that's very common, especially for the adults. These are cardiologic atrocies or tablets for heartburn. They're made from chalk and crushed oyster shells. Oyster shells are a source of calcium carbonate. We add some sugar and flavor, and now you have an 18th century toast. And although no records exist of what exactly the shop looked like then, Williamsburg's restoration of the apothecary was based on the original excavated 18th century foundations of old and closely mirrors other historic apothecaries from that era. The Pasteur Galt shop was rebuilt with two downstairs rooms. The one I stood in was where new herbs and medicines were to be explored. Fresh combinations were unlocked 
and where ailments would be addressed. We have camphorated oil we use as a muscle load for sore muscles, arthritic aches and pains. We still see camphor use today in things like a bang day, icy hot. This one in particular is for reviving people who have fainted or who are dizzy uh, because deer antler, parts horn specifically, when it's powdered and then roasted to remove the oils, it's got a very strong smell to it. It must have been a dance of discovery and rediscovery for druggists concocting medicines here, an eternal pursuit of uncovering nature's mysteries and harnessing their power for the betterment of the patient. So for them, um, another issue of, of vitamins is scurvy. They don't automatically figure out that vitamin C is the, the problem. They see lemon juice and orange juice and citrus working, and they assume that means that their theories about acids are correct. Embracing the vintage charm of the apothecary's haven of curatives, its wooden shelves and cabinets were heavily laden with jars of potions and elixirs that bared the name of their contents in abbreviated Latin. So for alcohol-based medicine, we've got syrup jars and then various non-horrible medicines up there. We have tincture of senna. Anytime you hear the words tincture or elixir, it means that it's, it's uh, alcohol-based as opposed to water-based. Uh, warming spices to kind of warm and stimulate the body to strengthen the constitution. Um, and they're thinking that that is another component of pre-surgery procedure that can help get the patient's body to a place where they can get through the life. Widely used as the exterior symbol of an apothecary shop in the 18th century, I daydreamed about hearing what must have been a rhythmic, age-old cadence filling this room as the apothecary's mortar and pestle with every twist and turn, enacted a magical transformation, grinding herbs into powders that held the potential to heal. The back room is where the apothecary surgeon orchestrated with calibrated precision under oftentimes tense scenarios. Surgical instruments were not just objects, but extensions of the surgeon's hands wielding the power to mend and transform. The tone of his voice would have provided a steady stream of guidance and reassurance during intricate procedures, a somewhat soothing counterpoint to the tension that inevitably accompanied most surgeries. The shop itself is known to hold some fascinating relics from the original apothecary that once stood here like old ointment pots, medicine jars, and medical paraphernalia that can be seen amongst its cabinetry and countertops. One item in particular I hope to get a glimpse of was one of Galt's earlier account books that was said to have been kept here. I know we used to have Dr. Galt's account book actually on display here. Since then, it's been placed with the Galt papers in the Swim Library on William and Mary's campus. It recorded a patient's extremely late medical payment to the tune of over five and a half years past due before being paid by cash. And even better, another outstanding bill recorded belonging to Patrick Henry, which appears he never paid. I did though stumble upon what I thought could have been, though not certain, the original secretary bookcase belonging to Dr. Galt, as well as what appeared to be his medical diplomas as I could faintly make out his name in one of them. As I prepared to leave the apothecary, I was reminded that the pursuit of well-being is not merely a contemporary quest, but a time-worn endeavor that has weathered the centuries. The apothecary's realm has allowed me to briefly traverse through the corridors of medical history, emerging with a newfound admiration for the pioneers of healing in Williamsburg. And as I exited the building's side door, I thought about how closing the chapter of an exploration is like closing a good book. Each one must come to an end, but a library of new experiences continues to beckon me. 
the next chapter always promising another narrative to unravel, new characters to meet, and fresh lessons to learn.